In this video, we're going to take a quick look at some more advanced statistical techniques to give a sense of what else is available and used in the professional world. In this course, we've looked at descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. The descriptive statistics material consisted mainly of thinking about how to summarize a population and making graphics or figures of data. The inferential statistics material consisted of learning about a variety of probability distributions and how to do statistical tests. I didn't mention it at the time, but when we use specific probability distributions to do statistical tests, we are technically using parametric techniques. It turns out there are two types of techniques in inferential statistics. Parametric techniques, the ones we've learned so far, assume that the sample comes from a population that exhibits a specific probability distribution. These techniques are more powerful than non-parametric techniques, but they're less robust because the probability distribution you're assuming could be wrong. Non-parametric techniques, in contrast, do not assume a specific probability distribution for the population. That results in them having less power, but they're more robust because there are fewer assumptions that may be violated. Looking at non-parametric techniques in more detail, the lack of a specific probability model limits their power because all the mathematical proofs and relationships that we have with certain probability distributions can't be used to gain information about the system. However, since there are fewer assumptions, the techniques are more robust and we are less likely to make an error by using a technique for which the assumptions are not true. For example, with non-parametric techniques, we don't need to worry about populations having equal variances or having normal distributions. The technique will work either way. But obviously, we would not be able to use the mathematical properties of the normal distribution to calculate confidence intervals or something similar to that. That being said, whether you're doing a parametric or non-parametric statistical technique, there's a common procedure for all inferential statistics. Remember that the problem is that we want to know a population parameter or a relationship, but we are data limited because we can't measure the whole population, we only have sample statistics to work with. The first step in our procedure will always be to make a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis about the population parameter or relationship. The second step will be to compute the probability of seeing some kind of sample test statistic value, for example the t-calculated or f-calculated value, if the null hypothesis is true. Finally, we make our decision. If p is small enough, then we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis as probably true. If p is not small enough, then we would fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that it may well be true. And we always need to keep in mind that whatever decision we make, we may be making a type 1 or type 2 error. You've seen this before, and this is basically saying the same thing, but it's worth restating. First, we pose a question about nature. That question depends on what aspect of biology we're interested in. Second, we need to figure out how to use some sort of metric to restate that question with numbers. Typically, numbers that allow us to see if there are differences between groups or relationships between different factors. But there can be other questions that we may ask. Third, we specify our null and alternative hypotheses for the question that we have in step two. Fourth, we gather data values from our system using whatever techniques and methods we have to to measure the metrics that we've decided to use in step two. Fifth, we use the data from step four to calculate some kind of test statistic. Sixth, the p-value of a statistical test is the probability of getting the test statistic in step five just because of sampling error if the null hypothesis is true. Remember that p stands for probability. Seventh, if the p-value is small, then we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. If the p-value is not small, then we would fail to reject the null hypothesis and we would not accept the alternative hypothesis. Eighth, we use our decision from step seven to answer our question in step two. Ninth, we use our answer from step eight to answer our original question in step one. No matter how complicated a statistical technique gets, if they generate a p-value, the interpretation of that p-value will always be the same. As you move forward and encounter other statistical techniques and methods, always remember this nine-step process will apply to all inferential statistics that involve hypothesis testing and give p-values. If you really take the time to understand what this yellow box represents, you will be in good shape for the future. If you remember nothing else from this course, please remember what a p-value represents. The p-value of a statistical test is the probability that the value we see
could arise due to sampling error if the null hypothesis is true. If the p-value is small, then we reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is not small, then we accept the null hypothesis. Or more technically, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. But for most practical purposes, this is equivalent to accepting the null hypothesis. We just need to keep in mind that type 1 and type 2 errors may be occurring. All statistical tests that generate p-values work in this way, both parametric and non-parametric techniques. To do statistics, all you really have to understand is what the null and alternative hypothesis means for your data so you can interpret the results. In the real world, we usually have software programs to do the details of the calculations. Okay, let's begin our tour of other statistical techniques by looking at other kinds of regressions. In this course, we learned about the linear regression, putting a straight line through data, but there are other kinds. There are non-linear regressions where we fit other equations to the data still using the least squares criterion. For example, we could fit a polynomial, an exponential, or a trigonometric function to our data, and then use the least squares criteria to figure out what the best values of those a, b, and c coefficients are. For example, we may wish to estimate exponential growth in a situation like a new pandemic to make predictions about future values. We may wish to use a trigonometric function if we're making predictions about temperatures at certain points of the year or some other system that we know cycles regularly. There is also multivariate regression, where we have more than one independent variable contributing to the dependent variable. We predict y from multiple predictor variables. The two examples there show a y that depends on either two or three independent variables. So instead of just having one y-intercept and slope to estimate, we would have a y-intercept and multiple slopes to estimate. We can imagine lots of circumstances where there may be more than one independent variable that contribute to something we're interested in. For example, if we were trying to predict a student's college GPA, we might wish to consider both their high school GPA and their SAT scores, not just one of those. Another type of regression is logistic regression. In this kind of regression, the y-axis is not an independent variable, it is a probability of an outcome that is related to one or more independent variables. The y-axis is given by the equation 1 over 1 minus e to the negative z, and z comes from contributions from a bunch of independent variables. Don't get too worried about the details of the math, just focus on the idea that a set of independent variables is being used to generate the probability of an outcome instead of an actual value. For example, if we were trying to estimate an individual's probability of getting lung cancer, f of z would be the risk of lung cancer. The first independent variable could be the number of cigarettes they smoke each day. The second independent variable could be the number of their parents who died from lung cancer. This is a proxy for their genetically modified risk. The third independent variable could be their income, in which case we expect a negative relationship because lower income people tend to have higher rates of cancer and there could be any number of different risk factors that contribute to the overall probability of getting lung cancer. We saw in a previous lecture that even their height may be important. Keep in mind that we're not estimating a concrete lung cancer value, but a probability. These kinds of calculations are extremely common in the insurance industry. Insurance companies collect information about those variables in order to calculate the probability that their customer will end up getting the condition for which they're insured then they can set their premiums in such a way as to make a profit. Principal component analysis is a very important technique, and you can think about it as what we end up doing if we have a multivariate regression with too many variables. Consider the question of what to do if we have 20 or more independent variables, that is, components. How can we possibly make sense of what's going on? The solution is to reduce those large number of variables down to a smaller number of principal components which are new variables made from combinations of the original components. In the figure on the left, you can see a plot of raw data, and if we want to describe the pattern, we would have to describe it using both x and y. But we can change these axes, essentially transforming our variables into two new ones, as shown in the figure on the right. Now the new axis, called principal component 1, which is in the direction of the highest variance, explains most of the variation in the data as shown by the r-squared being larger than 0.9. Principal component number 2 is minimally important. We have reduced the number of important variables from 2 down to 1. Each principal component can be thought of as a combination of relative contributions from the original variables. Bear with me now for a second. 
For more complicated systems with n variables, we are actually looking at data in an n-dimensional hyperspace. We identify the direction of highest variance and define that as principal component 1, then identify the orthogonal axis of highest remaining variance and define that as principal component 2, then identify the orthogonal axis of highest remaining variance and define that as principal component 3, and so on. The number of principal components will end up being the same as the number of original variables. Once we've done this, really, once our computer has done this, the first few principal components will explain most of the pattern. In this example, we can see that even though there appear to have been 20 original variables, the first principal component explains 70% of the variation. If we combine the first two principal components, they explain 85% of the variation. And if we combine the first three principal components, they would explain 92% of the variation. If we can wrap our heads around what those first three principal components represent, then we don't need to worry about the other 17 in order to understand 92% of what's going on. Here's an example from the New York Times where some researchers used a form of principal component analysis on a variety of measurable aspects in novels published between 1710 and 1920. Obviously, there are many, many variables in published literature, and these researchers focused on understanding the first two principal components they identified. One they came to understand as being stories that were more abstract versus more physical, that's on the x-axis as shown. The other they came to understand as being one that was more about emotions or time versus what they called medieval stuff, and that's on the y-axis. The components themselves are not inherently useful, but then the researchers plotted novels published over time and were able to see the general trend in 200 years of literature from more abstract to more physical, with a slight change from medieval to more emotional. And what was most interesting to the researchers was how Jane Austen's novels clustered in a region all on their own that seems to be ahead of her time. Her unique combination of emotion and abstraction may explain why she remains such a notable author even to this day. Here's another example, and it comes from a recent master's thesis from our own biology department. Rita Collins analyzed the diets of coyotes found in the Long Beach area and compared what they were eating in the dry season and in the wet season. You can see that table three includes a variety of different things that they ate, but with 11 different prey items, it's hard to see their overall diet shifts clearly. But then she created a canonical analysis plot using something very similar to principal components analysis to describe the shift in diet. From her figure, we can see how in the wet season, they eat fewer vegetables, but more mesocarnivores, whereas in the dry season, they shift more to vegetation and away from animal prey. Principal components is mainly used to do things like this. Take a very complex situation with many variables and reduce them down into a smaller number that we can seek to understand so that we know more about our system. Our next technique is the Mann-Whitney U-Test, which asks whether two samples are from the same population distribution. You can think of this like a t-test that's comparing locations, but it doesn't have normality or variance assumptions. For this reason, it is sometimes considered a median test. First, we list all the data from both datasets in order from smallest to largest. Second, for each value from the first dataset, we count the number from dataset 2 that are smaller. Third, we add up all the values in step 2 and compare this to n1 times n2, the sample sizes for the two datasets, which would be the maximum value we could have gotten. The figure shows what would happen. Looking on the left, if every value in dataset 1 was smaller than every value in dataset 2, then the u value would be 0. Looking on the right, if every value in dataset 1 was larger than every value in dataset 2, then the u value would be 1. When there's a lot of overlap, we would get intermediate u values. The fourth step is to calculate the p-value of getting a u-value as large or as small as we do. And then that's used to accept or reject the null hypothesis that these samples come from the same population distribution. The sign test is a test that is used for data without quantitative values. For example, imagine we want to know whether a treatment increases values or not, but we know there's a high degree of measurement error, so the variance would be extremely large and our t-test would be useless. Or perhaps we have a situation where the variables are not easily quantified. They can be put into categories, but specific numbers don't make sense. 
The sign test is a good method to determine whether the number of increases compared to the number of decreases is what we would expect from random error if we expect random numbers, or whether there seems to be something non-random going on. First, we get baseline scores or measurements. Second, we give the treatment. Third, we retest the subjects, and instead of focusing on the values, we just record whether the value increased or decreased. Our null hypothesis, if nothing was going on, would be that the number of increases will equal the number of decreases. Our alternative hypothesis is that they would not be equal. We can then use the binomial distribution and a probability of 0.5 to calculate the probability of seeing as many increases and decreases as we do. For example, if our data is plus plus minus minus plus 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 minus plus plus, that would be seven increases and three decreases. We can then go look at the binomial distribution as shown. From that, we can see that seven or more increases would actually be expected about 17% of the time. The overall p-value of our test would be 0.34 if we were doing a two-tailed test, and 0.172 if we were doing a one-tailed test. But either way, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis of equal numbers of increases and decreases. Seven increases and three decreases is not good enough data for us to conclude that this treatment generally increases the values. Spearman rank correlation is the correlation method which uses relative ranks instead of numerical values. This is used for situations in which individuals are present in two datasets which can be ranked. The question it asks is whether the ranks of the individuals in each of the two different lists are correlated or not. First, we get the ranks of each individual in dataset A. Second, we get the ranks of each individual in dataset B. Third, assuming all the ranks are distinct from one another, we calculate the test statistic indicated. The DI numbers indicate the difference in ranks for individual I. An RS of 1 is perfect correlation, where the same individual is first in both datasets, the same individual is second in both datasets, etc. An RS of negative 1 is perfect negative correlation, in which the individual who is first in dataset A is last in dataset B. The second individual in dataset A is second to last in dataset B, etc. Determining whether values of RS are significantly different than zero can be done by comparing them to critical values from a table. The null hypothesis is that there is no correlation. The ranks in dataset A and B are independent of one another. The alternative hypothesis is that the ranks of datasets A and B are not independent of one another. The Kruskal-Wallis test is analogous to the one-way ANOVA, but instead of using numerical values, we use rank values. In other words, instead of looking at the actual magnitude of the numbers, we just think about whether it is the largest, the second largest, the third largest, etc. This technique will then compare whether the ranks of different groups tend to be similar to each other or if they are significantly different. This test is less powerful than the ANOVA, but can be used if the data is not normally distributed or if their variances are different, which you'll recall was a problem when trying to use the ANOVA. First, we combine all the values from the k different groups into one large data set, but we keep track of which group each value came from. Second, we calculate the ranked values for each value in this combined set. Third, we use the equation shown to the right to calculate the value of h. If there are no ties, in other words, all the ranks are unique, then the second, more simple equation can be used. Again, don't worry about the details of this equation, it's just there so you know it exists. You're not going to have to actually use it to perform any calculations in this class. The null hypothesis of the Kruskal-Walls test is that the population centers are all equal, whereas the alternative hypothesis is that the population centers are not all equal. We decide whether we think the null hypothesis or alternative hypothesis holds by comparing our calculated value of h to critical values from a table or having a computer tell us the probability of obtaining an h value as large as we did if only sampling error is going on. I wanted to include this slide here to point out that the ANOVA technique can be expanded to analyze a wider variety of data. The MANOVA, which stands for Multivariate Analysis of Variance, is essentially an ANOVA with more than one dependent variable. The ANCOVA, which stands for Analysis of Covariance, is a technique that combines the ANOVA approach of factors creating categories of data with a regression in which there is an additional independent continuous variable that may influence our dependent variable.
This is used when you have a mix of continuous correlations and discrete categories. The AMOVA, which stands for Analysis of Molecular Variance, is a technique that compares patterns of genetic variation in populations to determine whether they appear to be the same, which indicates interbreeding, or different, which would indicate reproductively isolated populations. It uses the same idea of comparing the variation within to the variation between populations, but uses genetic data instead of numbers. The permutation test is a method that can be used to compare any statistic we're interested in, such as a median, mode, variance, etc. It is a very versatile technique. The way it works is by scrambling the data to see how unlikely the test statistic is, in other words, directly calculate a p-value. For example, imagine we have data from two groups that show a difference in their medians, and we want to know whether this is a significant difference or the sort of difference that sampling error could easily cause. First, we calculate that initial difference in medians and call that x. Second, we combine all the data from the two datasets together, and then randomly divide it into two new datasets. We have permuted the data. Third, we calculate a new difference between the medians of our two new permuted datasets. Fourth, we do steps two and three lots of times and record each value. Fifth, we can then plot the distribution of all the values we obtained in step four, which will be a probability distribution for the difference in medians. Sixth, we can then see how unlikely it is that we would have gotten our original value from step one based on the distribution in step five. Imagine that the figure to the right shows the medians calculated in step four. If our original difference in medians had been 25, we get a p-value of 0.1825 and not reject our null hypothesis. The observed difference in medians of 25 is not a significant difference in the medians, and we would lack the evidence to conclude that they are samples from populations with different medians. If our original difference in medians had been 55, our p-value would be 0.065, which would give us the same result. However, it's much closer to a significant difference, and therefore suggestive that maybe something is going on. We would probably wonder if we're making a type 2 error. And if our original difference in medians had been 65, this distribution would give us a p-value of 0.03, which would cause us to reject our original null hypothesis we could conclude that the samples appear to come from populations with different medians. Of course now, since the p-value is only slightly less than 0.05, we may wonder whether we're making a type 1 error. Lastly, we come to bootstrapping. In bootstrapping, we resample our original dataset again and again to determine how unlikely the test statistic we obtained was. In other words, what the p-value is. One example of a use for bootstrapping is to construct confidence intervals around observed sample statistics. First, we calculate our sample statistic. Second, we create a new dataset by sampling with replacement from our original dataset. Third, we calculate our sample statistic again from this new dataset. Fourth, we repeat step three many times. Fifth, we plot the distribution of the sample statistic values. Sixth, now that we have the distribution of values from our bootstrap datasets, we can calculate a confidence interval by identifying regions within that distribution that contain certain proportions of the test statistic values. The figure to the right shows how this works. You can see the center region that contains 66% of the test statistic values represents a 66% confidence interval for the original test statistic, and so forth. It may seem strange that we can resample one data set to create a confidence interval. It almost seems like circular logic. But it turns out that it can be a useful technique because it can be used for more than just confidence intervals of numbers. As I mentioned in the previous slide, bootstrapping seems to rely on circular logic, and in fact, that's where its name comes from. In 1785, Rudolf Raspe wrote a book called Baron Munchausen's Narrative of His Marvelous Travels and Campaigns in Russia. This was made into a movie starring some of the Monty Python cast and Robin Williams in 1988. The story is ridiculous fantasy and includes a scene in which the Baron gets stuck in a muddy swamp and saves himself by reaching down and grabbing the straps on the back of his boots and pulling upwards, which then lifts him up into the air and out of the mud. This is a metaphor for the circular logic that appears to be at play for the bootstrapping statistical technique. <laughs>
That this is circular logic for the statistical technique is just an illusion, however. Since the sample probably demonstrates the properties of the overall population, using it to model the overall population is not completely unrealistic. And if you don't have other alternatives, it can be a valid technique. Let's look at an example from the part of biology that uses bootstrapping the most, phylogenetics. Let's explore this issue by asking how dog breeds are related to one another. Most people are aware that modern dog breeds, like shown on the right, are related to wolves. However, many incorrectly think that means dogs have evolved from modern wolves. The truth is that dogs evolved from the organisms that 10,000 years ago were the ancestor of both modern dogs and modern wolves. It's a subtle distinction, but important. That being said, domesticated dog breeds have been modified by selective breeding considerably from an ancestor that probably did look quite a bit like modern wolves. For example, we have bulldogs that have skulls so highly modified that they are unable to give birth without medical intervention. We have dachshunds, sometimes called wiener dogs, which have elongated weasel-like bodies. And that's deliberate. They were bred to hunt weasels. And we have chihuahuas, which are tiny dogs ideal for carrying in a purse. What you may not know is that there have been other breeds over time as well. The black and white picture shows something called a turnspit dog in the wheel in the background. This breed of dog was specifically designed to run in that wheel and turn the spit, which would then roast the meat. They were like an early motor before motors were invented. But then motors were invented, and that dog breed no longer had a purpose, and the breed is now extinct. There are so many breeds of dogs, showing such diversity of behavior and morphology, how are they related? To address this question, Parker et al. studied genetic variation in 96 microsatellite locations in 414 dogs from 85 breeds. When they used their data to get a phylogenetic tree depicting the relationships, they needed some way to test how reliable those relationships were. So what they did was bootstrap their original data set to create new data sets from which they created more phylogenetic trees. They did this 100 times, picked the most common phylogenetic tree, and then indicated how often specific parts of that tree showed up in their 100 trees. The number 100 at the base of the domesticated dog breeds indicates that all 100 trees grouped every domesticated dog breed more closely to the other domesticated dog breeds than to modern wolves. This indicates that all domesticated dog breeds appear to have had a single domestication origin. In this figure, we can see that some breeds always clustered near each other, like Siberian Husky and Alaskan Malamute, which is no surprise because these breeds are very similar. Likewise for Afghan Hound and Saluki. If you know those breeds, they're quite distinct and similar to one another. On the other hand, in the Sharpei, Shibu Inu, Chow Chow, and Akita group, the relationships were less repeatable. It turns out that almost all the other breeds we have are less distinct from each other than these breeds are. Other breeds appear to have mostly been developed during the last few hundred years instead of early on in the domestication process like the nine breeds shown here. And in this figure, you can see the very rapid explosion of these different dog breeds. And the lack of high bootstrap numbers in most of it indicates that it is very difficult to figure out how some of these breeds are related to one another. But enough about general relationships. There is one dog breed that is more interesting than all the other ones. Australian Shepherds, like my dog Starbuck, are actually kind of a mystery. They don't have a long history in the breeding community, and they just kind of showed up in the American West in the 1800s. There is no evidence they have anything to do with Australia, but they are shepherds in that they have a strong herding instinct and were used for that purpose in the West. It's practically hardwired. My dog gets very, very concerned when my girlfriend and I are nowhere close to each other when the three of us are walking in public. There is no historical data to indicate where this breed comes from, but we have this genetic data and luckily this group did test Australian shepherds. This data suggests that Australian Shepherds and Border Collies are each other's closest relatives. The best guess from this data at the next closest relative is the English Sheepdog. Border Collies and Australian Shepherds look very similar and have many of the same behaviors, so that's not really a surprise. But the English Sheepdog looks very different. However, its behaviors are very similar. This more recent paper by some of the same authors indicates how large a phylogeny can get this cladogram uses much more data for larger number of domesticated dog breeds, but you can still see that they're using the bootstrap technique to assess the reliability and consistency of different parts of their diagram. 
Interestingly, this data set indicates that Australian Shepherds are more closely related to regular Collies and Shelties than they are to Border Collies. The morphology of Australian Shepherds seems much more like Border Collies, but the coat patterns of Australian Shepherds are much more similar to Collies and Shelties. Obviously, with very complex data sets like this, it can become very hard to really understand how much confidence we can have in particular patterns. With bootstrapping, our statistical test results are essentially turning into descriptive statistics and blurring the line between those two aspects of statistics. Examples like this one can show just how complicated some statistical approaches can get. I hope you found this quick tour useful. This course just teaches the foundation of statistics. The professional world has a wide range of methods and techniques used for different types of data. Each focused field in biology has its own special techniques, but the core ideas from this class will still apply.